welcome to the uh, endovascular webinar, uh, joint with the Vascular Society and BSET. Uh, so thank you for making the time to, um, to log in. Uh, we're going to dive straight into our first speaker, who's Kaji Stritharan from Liverpool, who's going to talk about how she does iliac intervention. Uh, just as a point of order, please remember to mute your mics and look out for the Q&A box. Uh, we'll be fielding questions. And at the end of Kaji's 25 minutes, she'll be answering questions. So Kaji, over to you, if you want to share your slides. Um, thank you for the introduction, Nathan. Thank you for the invitation. Um, what I'm going to talk about in the next 25 minutes is ILIAC in, um, interventions and really um, give you a how-to or more like how I do ILIAC interventions and a general approach to both common ILIAC stenotic disease occlusions, um, external iliac disease, um, with some tips and tricks and talk a little bit about the evidence um, and also how to start a service. So it's estimated that about 3,600 iliac interventions are done each year in the UK. Um, on the right hand side is um, the task two classification for um, iliac disease. Um, and the traditional way of looking at it is task A and B lesions are amenable to angioplasty or endovascular um, intervention and C and D um, use historically used to be the group that we would treat surgically. Um, and I think it, it's fair to say in the last decade or so, or so with advances in techniques, um, the appreciation of the low complication rates and, and very good one year patency that more and more people are going for the endovascular first approach or the hybrid approach to um, aorto iliac disease. Um, this is data from the BIAS and BSIR registry from 2011 to 2014, and it captures about 8,000 cases. And what you notice is that the majority um, of patients have prolidication, so about 5,000 of the 8,000 8, group um, have iliac um, interventions for symptoms of claudication. So a fair number. Um, the most commonly treated iliac segment is the common iliac vessel. Um, and the success rate is, is very exceptionally high. It's about 97%. And actually the, the lesion that's most difficult to cross appears to be that the external iliac artery. If we look again at angioplasting versus stenting, so different approaches to common ex and external iliac disease, what you notice is that there is a huge variation in those who angioplasty versus those who stent. Um, and that heterogeneity in treatment often means that there really isn't a huge amount of data um, to give that degree of variation in practice. And I'll come along to the evidence later on in my talk. Um, it's worth noting that whilst the complication rate is low, there is a complication rate. And if you are treating claudicants, you have to appreciate and counsel patients that there is a, a approximately 1% risk of distal embolization and limb loss. So planning um, is the key to iliac interventions. Um, in terms of imaging, I always tend to dual image. So I'll do a duplex scan um, as well as a CT scan. And I use the CT really to, to size um, and plan both the ballooning and, and stenting. Um, for both common iliac and external iliac, um, stenotic and occlusive disease, I tend to do a one-to-one -one sizing. Um, and the caution there really is that you've got to be aware of those very small iliac um, vessels common in those short um, female um, patients. And in those patients, you either think about a surgical option, we're really thinking about oversizing those iliacs. So small stents um, perform badly in the iliac segment. So in terms of my general approach to common iliac stenotic disease, I'll tackle that first. So I go for an ipsilateral retrograde approach, which means I tackle the same side as the lesion. I usually start with a five or six French short sheath, um, puncture the common femoral artery, or if I'm doing a hybrid approach, com um, puncture the patch. Um, and dependent on the, that degree of stenosis, I either go with an 035 platform, so an 035 truma and a KMP catheter, or I'll use an 035 Navicross, um, so a hydrophilic coated catheter, and use an 018 advantage wire, which is probably um, one of my favorite wires for um, crossing tight stenotic lesions. Um, when you think about sizing, usually the common iliac is, is that in the ballpark of eight millimeters. The external iliac is in the ballpark about seven millimeters um, and the SFA six millimeters and, and so on. 
Um, once I've punctured the ipsilateral side, I tend to take a pigtail up to the bifurcation. Just remember, you need to give a bit of RAO or LAO, depending on what's, what um, iliac you're imaging, in order to view that internal iliac origin clearly. Um, and try and preserve that um, internal if you can. I then exchange for a semi-stiff wire, so any sort of ballooning or stenting, I'll do either over an amplaps or a rosin wire. Um, and before I think about um, introducing a stent, I always pre-dilate, well, not when I say always, if it's a tight stenosis or an occlusion, I will pre-dilate um, the vessel before introducing seven French sheath. Um, if you're using a covered uh, blue mountain stent or an uncovered blue mountain stent, um, don't bear back that stent through the lesion. Um, think about using that seven French sheath um, uh, as, as a way of protecting that balloon. So my first case is an 80 year old lady, um, two year history of left intermittent claudication and progressing more recently to gangrene of the fourth toe. Unfortunately a smoker, but um, has CLI, so mandated um, to a degree to treat her and she was diabetic. Um, her duplex image, imaging demonstrates moderate plaques within the common femoral artery um, and a very tight stenosis with a PSV of 477 in the proximal external iliac vessel. Um, this is um, a CT imaging. You notice the bifurcation is clear and then there's a very horrible calcified um, plaque within the common iliac. Um, so this lady went on to have a left groin cut down an end arterectomy bovine patch, and then I tend to puncture the patch in a retrograde fashion. Um, she had both SFA as well as iliac disease, so we treated the iliac inflow first, reversed the sheath and treated the SFA. Um, the lesion was crossed in this case with a Navicross and an 018 Advantage wire. Um, a pigtail was put to the bifurcation, and this is the run, and you can see quite a coralline type stenotic lesion within the common iliac. Um, and really the points worth taking into are we're quite far from the bifurcation, so we don't need to think about using a kissing stent. Um, there's a patent internal, so you really want to think about keeping that in play. And again, a tight lesion. So if we're thinking about putting a blue mounted stent, we'll probably want to um, pre-dilate that with a four or five millimeter balloon, take your seven French sheath up, um, and then um, take your um, balloon, and this is a, an atrium balloon up, up to the level where you want to um, deploy the stent, um, withdraw that sheath back and inflate the balloon. What you'll notice with the atrium balloon is that you get this what's called dog boning, um, and that's really something to watch out for, um, particularly if you've got tight um, or small vessels um, within the external iliac, because that's often a, a site where, you, where um, there is a risk of, of rupture and that's the uncovered portion of the stent. Um, usually um, inflate the balloon to nominal and it can take a few seconds for it to reach um, the size that it should be. What you notice here is that there is some, still some residual, residual disease within that external and what we've done there is put uh, a bare metal stent, so a self-expanding bare metal stent. Um, my choice of bare metal stent is an absolute pro stent. Um, and then we've post dilated it. And that's the result you have. And you can see the absolute pro stent, the internal still in place. So it was just put right up until that internal um, bifurcation. So how do you decide which stent you're going to use? Um, and different people will have different preferences. Um, there are anatomical considerations. Uh, are you putting it in the common iliac versus the ex external iliac? Do you use a balloon expandable versus a self-expanding stent? Or do you use a covered versus an uncovered stent? So balloon expandable, examples of them are the atrium, um, the um, a Bentley B stents, and the uncovered, um, an example with the OmniLink stent. The advantage of a balloon expandable stent is really the precision that you can place the stent. So it's very good for bifurcation disease. It also has a high radial force. You've got the ability to over dilate it and you can also flare it as well. So it gives you one to two extra millimeters if you need it. Um, the disadvantage, particularly uh, with the um, covered stents is that they are rigid. They can foreshorten. 
um, and they're more expensive than a bare metal stent. Um, you also get this dog boning phenomena with the particularly with the atrium stents. Um, but as I said before, atrium is my first line for common iliac lesions. And I think as you develop your, your practice, you'll tend to have a go-to stent that you go to. So when we're talking about self-expanding stents, um, there are a number of them out there. Again, very good uh, one-year patency results. Um, the advantages of a self-expanding stent is they apply this constant out outward force after they've been deployed. They're flexible, relatively crush resistant, and they're actually very good when you're trying to um, bridge that overlap in size between the common and the external, um, whilst also al allowing you to keep um, uh, the lumen patency of the internal. The disadvantage is they're not precise um, to deploy and they have this tendency either to jump forward or, or jump back, depending on what stent you use. Um, and here at the Absolute Pro, as I've mentioned before, is, is my, well, it tends to be my first choice for external iliac extenting. Um, there are a number of self-expanding covered stents um, and usually um, examples where you use them are either for a CTO uh, within the external iliac artery um, or as a, as a bailout stent. Um, the advantage is they are uh, flexible um, and they're useful uh, when you do have vessel rupture, but they do need a larger sheath. Um, and when you lose a covered stent, um, it can have potential catastrophic wrecks because you, are, you have covered the branches. So there is very little um, opportunity to collateralize um, pre before it goes down. So I've so shown this slide, which basically um, shows the, uh, the diameters for uh, the gore barba and endoprosthesis and also the sheath sizes as well. So you can see that actually, if you're looking at an eight, nine, 10 uh, millimeter endoprosthesis, you're talking about putting an eight French um, sheath in. So where's the evidence? Um, and unfortunately, there isn't a huge amount of randomized control trial evidence. Um, there's only one RCT which looks at um, covered and uncovered um, balloon expanding stents, and that's the COBEST trial, which looked at 168 iliac arteries. It was an Australian study with follow-up up to about 18 months. Um, and they essentially concluded that for task C and D lesions, that, that cover stents seem to perform better um, than bare metal balloon expanding stents um, with very good um, patencies up to five years of about 75%. Um, when we look at both self-expanding um, and balloon expanding bare metal stents, again, there's only one study really, um, and that's the ICE trial, um, a large study of about 660 patients looking at claudicants, slightly controversial, about 60% of them were smokers. Um, and what they notice is that with both um, self-expanding and balloon expanding bare metal stents, um, there was reasonable uh, patency at one year down the line. And what they actually noticed is that the iliac occlusive stents, the self-expanding stents compared to the blue expanding stents actually did better. And um, I think this is a useful set of guidelines really um, just to, to, to focus things. Um, it's, a, it's a paper that came out earlier on this year. Um, what it is is, is um, a set of recommendations um, and from America, what this group did that they looked at or did a systematic review um, and actually looked at 131 papers um, and through a Delphi consensus process set about um, a set of recommendations, which is actually quite helpful, especially if you're setting out in practice. Um, so what it tends to say is that um, bare metal, self examining bare metal sense seems to have quite strong recommendation for use in both the common and the external iliac balloon um, expandable bare metal stents, as well as covered um, balloon expandable stents do quite well or recommended in the iliac bifurcation and also within the common iliac. Um, and then there's good evidence to suggest that covered stents also do well in moderately severely calcified lesions. Um, Patrick's asked me to touch on the glass classification as opposed to task um, two classification. And um, I'm going to touch on this just very briefly, uh, just to say that it exists um, and it was developed following um, this global vascular guidelines on the management of chronic limb threatening um, ischemia. Um, and what it essentially recognises is that task is very simplistic um, and takes um, 
anatomical levels of disease in isolation. Um, and there's a recognition that um, a chronic limb threatening ischemia is multi-level disease. Um, and when you are trying to develop evidence-based practice or, or, or trying to apply evidence-based practice, you need to take into account both patient factors, limb severity, and also complexity of disease when making your management decision. Um, and GLASS classifies uh, femoral popliteal and infrapopliteal disease into various grades, um, depending on the degree of stenosis and um, complexity. Um, using the grade of femoral popliteal and infrapopliteal disease, you then develop a GLASS stage. And the GLASS stage, when put together with limb severity as defined by the Wi-Fi score, um, gives you a guide in terms of, of um, how you should manage that patient, whether it be open versus endovascular versus no intervention at all. So where does iliac disease fall into that? So iliac disease is mentioned in the, in the glass staging um, and you can hide perhaps um, stage one or stage two. Um, importantly to say, um, it's really the infrapopliteal um, segment and the infra, uh, femoropopliteal segment that plays the greatest role within the glass classification in terms of establishing glass um, grade. And um, the guidelines simply state that you should be correcting that inflow disease, both at the aorta iliac and at the CFA level. Um, a couple more cases to present. So this is a 70 year old male 10 meter claudicant smoker. Um, his duplex demonstrates that there's right common iliac origin disease with marked plaques within the common femoral. Um, these are some key shots from his CT scan. Again, you can see severe calcification at the iliac origin, the common iliac origin on the right, and severe disease within the right common femoral. Um, so the approach here was we would cut down, do an open cut down, endarterectomize, bovine patch, the common femoral, puncture the patch um, to um, cross that lesion. So given that he also has, um, we're thinking, you should be really thinking with any sort of origin disease that you're most likely going to be using kissing stents. Um, and when I'm thinking about doing kissing stents, I also have a very low threshold of puncturing the other side first. And that often acts as a good guide to help you navigate the disease side. So that is the angiogram demonstrating the disease. And you've got a coralline um, plaque within the right common iliac um, origin. Um, this is a single screenshot, but what it effectively shows is I've managed to cross um, and I'm using an 018 trailblazer um, and actually one of the Asahi wires, the Asahi gladius wires trying to cross this. Um, and then I reach a point um, where I can't seem to progress that catheter wire anymore. So if you put uh, some contrast in through the catheter, you can see that you're not quite into um, the right plane. Um, and you're probably subintimal into that lesion, even though it's a stenosis rather than a CTO. So that lesion was eventually crossed um, again, that, and you can see the amplex wire, the long sheath being put in, and the same principle as, as before. So two long sheaths taken up to the bifurcation, um, to, um, put your atrium stents back up, pull the sheath back, um, and expand the stents. Sometimes with the atriums, it's quite difficult to see the stent. And actually, if you do a single high shot fluoro, you can see um, the stents a little bit more clearer there and you actually see whether they've opened out or not. Um, so when you're thinking about kissing stents, I, I really would say, are you sure you need to use kissing stents? So, um, and actually where is the hypogastric artery in relation to this? Because the hypogastric artery actually plays quite a significant, important role. Um, the other thing to think is about what is the size of the common iliac arteries? How are you sizing your stents? And I said before, I tend to use a one-to-one -one sizing. If you do do a one-to-one -one sizing, what's the size of that distal aorta? So how will those stents sit in the distal aorta? So why is this important? So this is um, some kissing stents, um, which were inserted about six months ago um, by, of course it was by one of my colleagues, and obviously not myself. Um, and then this is the CT scan 
um, six months down the line. And so what you have is early graft, um, early stent failure and occlusion of the right limb of the graft. And then you have to say, well, why has that happened? Um, and it's always easy when you look back. Um, so what we saw before is there were two nine millimeter stents. Um, so that would give you an overall diameter of about 18 millimeters. And this was put into an aorta, which had a diameter of about 12 to 13 millimeters. Um, so there was just simply too oversized. It's not surprising that at one point um, they were going to impinge on each other. So I've talked a little bit about it for female gender, and I think female gender is a risk of predictor of stenosis because of the smaller iliac vessels. Um, but I'd be very cautious about putting a five millimeter stent into a five millimeter external iliac. And I think the better route there is to oversize, oversize covered stent and use a crack and pave type method. Um, other predictors are diabetes, young age, poor outflow, um, and CTO uh, versus stenotic disease. So we've already touched a little bit on my approach to CTOs. So if I, I tend to use a contralateral five French puncture, I do a DSA from the bifurcation, and I'll actually cross the lesion from the ipsilateral retrograde. I take an ipsilateral retrograde approach to cross that bifurcation. <coughs> if it's a tight stenosis, again, I go for Navi cross and use an 018 advantage. If it's a CTO, then I prefer to go on an 014 platform and really the wires that I tend to go for either the Confianza or the, uh, the Gladius um, or the Astato. Um, and these are essentially weighted wires and you can see the tip load here. So it's the Gladius has a three gram tip load, the Confianza a 12 gram lip load and the Astato um, is a far more severe um, CTO while with a 30 gram tip load. Um, I try to stay intraluminal, um, and, and that's really when you're doing things um, like puncturing through through a, a bovine patch, you need to make sure that you so you start intraluminal and you stay intraluminal. Um, when I first started my practice, I tended to go through the way where you create massive loops. So I'd use an 035 um, semi-stiff um, Terumo, create a, a massive loop. Um, and when I wanted to break back, reduce that loop. And I've gone away from that um, to a platform where it's small wires remain intraluminal and try and stay intraluminal. Um, if you can't break back um, with this, if you have moved into the subintum channel and you can't break back, um, your bailout really is either to use a re-entry device um, and that can either be a, a, consider it when you can't break back in or use or plan to use it. Um, once I've crossed the lesion, once again, as I said before, I exchange for semi-stiff wire, pre-dilate, and for the common iliac, I'll use a balloon mounted um, stent, covered stent. For an external iliac, if it's a CTO, I'd use a biovan. If it's a stenosis, a, a bare metal self expanding stent. So um, I've got another case of 65 year old uh, male bilateral claudicant after only about five meters and rest pain. Um, who's morbidly obese with hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, diabetes, and had a cardiac arrest about four years ago. On the right, he's got um, moderate calcific disease calling, causing moderate narrowing within the common iliac and moderate to severe external iliac disease. And on the left-hand side, his common iliac and external iliac is occluded. Um, I've shown this CT scan really just to show his size. Um, and after a lot of debate about auto biferm, max low biferms, um, we went, to, we attempted to recanalize um, his iliac system. So bilateral groin pup, um, cut downs, um, endarterectomies and bovine patches bilaterally, um, punctured the right groin, got a pigtail up to the bifurcation. <coughs> um, and that's the run, so you can see there, there is a stump and then very little flow downstream of that. Um, this basically shows my uh, puncturing of uh, the ipsilateral side. You can see my catheter just there. Um, what I'm doing is just very slow flushes just to ensure that I am I stay intraluminal um, within that. So you can see the contrast there. Um, and then I use the Asahi Stato wire for this case um, and uh, the Trailblaze wire to, to cross that lesion.
Um, so once that lesion's crossed, again, seven French um, long sheath up to the top of the bifurcation, um, a uh, blue mounted covered stent. Um, and you can just about to make it out if you watch the bottom of the screen, you can see that the eight, um, there's a, a via, long viabine stent being deployed, post dilated. And this is the final picture. So if you have an iliac CTO and you aren't able to cross it, you have got a number of, of options. If you can't uh, cross via the ipsilateral approach, if there's a stump or even if there isn't a stump, think about the contralateral anterograde approach. Um, if I was to pass contralateral, I'd then move to an 035 platform, use a rim as my crossing catheter, take a long seven French um, sheath up to the bifurcation for support. Um, and then I usually go for a sub interval plane and try to break back within the common femoral. Um, your other options are um, a brachial access or a fem-fem crossover. Have I got time for another case, Lee? No, I don't think so. You did very well, though. You covered uh, everything and um, pretty much came to, kept, kept to time. Uh, there, there are a couple of questions, Kaji. Okay. Uh, you um you concentrate a lot on stenting, but one of the delegates is asking, when is it reasonable to just do angioplasty? When would you consider doing that? Um, so with the type of disease I see, I, I very rarely just do angioplasty. And I, I think um, if you've got multi-level disease and tight stenotic disease, you will often end up coming back. So my answer to that is, is for the iliac system, I have a very low threshold. Um, and uh, very rarely angioplasty, I go for, go for stenting. Yeah, I think um, in the olden days, we used to see relatively straightforward disease and we were treating claudicants and now we treat, very rarely treat claudicants or unless it's um, severely limiting. Um, and so a lot of your cases are quite complex. Why, why would you choose an atrium stent? Is that just familiarity? I think it's familiarity and historical, so it's it's the one that I probably understand the most, um, and it's a stent that very uh, I feel comfortable using. The other one I've used is a, is a B stent, um, which again is a very nice stent to use. Um, but but um, I think certainly if you find if you when you when you're starting you you have a set of tools and you develop and you pick and choose and which ones you get rid of, and as your technique develops. Um, the HM was the one that, that was one that, that stayed as, as part of that toolkit. And the other thing you mentioned, uh, and I'm sure the other uh, talkers will speak about, um, puncturing the patch after you've done the femoral endarterectomy, isn't that a bit of a risky strategy if you can't get back through into the iliac? Wouldn't you consider treating the inflow first? Um, so th the reason I do that is that you still have you still have flow when you puncture a patch. Um, I think it, you, you, you've got your best. I've never not been able to recanalize having punctured a patch, and I think whenever you go into doing something like that, you always have to have a backup. And if you and if that backup happens to be a fem fem crossover, so be it. Um, but I've, I've, there have always I, I tend to go into an operation with the view of completing it with one of my bailout options if you can't recanalize. Somewhat controversial questions come through uh, from somebody who I'm sure knows the answer. You were talking about one year primary patency, but how do you define success in an iliac endovascular intervention? So if you notice that a lot of the cases I do aren't um, pure iliac cases. Um, so they're not that group of claudicants. So probably at least 50 plus percent is that group. Well, I'll treat the common uh, femoral, I'll do something within the iliac and probably do something within the SFA or the tibials at the same time. Um, and so the, the group that I treat tend to me more towards that really short distance claudicant or, or that CLI group, which I think are different category of patients. Um, and so forth, therefore your marker of success then, and they're, they're a group that are, are multi-morbid group. Um, in terms of life expectancy with a CLI group, we're talking about sort of 50% of three years. So um, your, your marker of success really is um, amputation free survival in, in, in that group. Okay, last question then. Um, what about post-treatment? Do you have a surveillance program and do you treat them with specific medication? Um, so 
for iliac disease, I'm happy with a high dose statin and a single antiplatelet. Um, we do have um, a surveillance program. I think if you're putting stents in, um, you have to have a relatively robust way of monitoring them, certainly up to about 18 months. Um, and certainly the, the data seems to show that if you have restenosis, it's usually about the 12 to 18 month mark that that seems to occur. Okay, thank you very much. You can relax now. Uh, Thanasis Dianotopoulos is from St. Thomas's Hospital in London. You'll be very keen to know he's been so keen to make it to the, the talk that he's ran, ran home from the hospital having done a case. So thanks for joining us. And uh, would you like to present your cases, please? Yes, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm really, really sorry that I was late, but I was stuck with a case which took a bit longer than expected. Uh, but I'm here and I'm happy, very, very happy to be here. Thank you all for the invitation. Um, I really enjoyed the talk from Kadzias and was quite a good overview of all the techniques. I've decided I have two cases. Uh, I don't think I will have time to do both, to be honest, but I think the one that I have chosen as first is a good example of things that can go wrong. And it's good to discuss uh, successes and it's good to discuss how we uh, see things going through smoothly when the when everything goes right. Uh, but especially with the Alex, um, my personal view is that if things go wrong, they can go really, really, really wrong. So we need to be careful and we need to be ready to deal with the complications. So I will present you a case that uh, we treated at St. Thomas a uh, few years ago. It's a 50 year old lady who had Aliac bilateral external aliac artery occlusions. Uh, she was suffering from life limiting claudication, less than 50 meters uh, ability to walk, and had bilateral absent femoral pulses. She was a smoker and she had an increased PMI, so she wasn't suitable for an uh, open surgery. Uh, and as you can see, this was the CTA, which demonstrated bilateral occlusions with good internal aliac arteries. Uh, so what we did in this case, I've did this case combined with one of my surgical uh, vascular surgeon colleagues. We did bilateral retrograde access, but unfortunately to begin with, as you can see, we start with the right side and I don't know if you can appreciate, this doesn't look exactly luminal. So in the first, in the first contrast injection, the wire immediately traveled and crossed submintimal. And I appreciate that we try to stay intraluminal. However, that is not always the case or we cannot control to stay intraluminal. So the wire immediately went submintimal. So at this point we decided let's wait and let's get access from the other side to see how that side looks. On this side, we've managed not to make a mess and we stayed intraluminal without causing any dissections to begin with. Now, I, we, we tried to cross from the left side, as you can see, and eventually managed to re-enter. As you can, I'm sure you can appreciate that this was not exactly again intraluminal. The wire managed to go to find its way through the subminimal space and re-entry uh, without problems at the level of the common aliac artery. You can see a very nice picture depiction of the common uh, aliac artery on the right side. However, they were, were still having problems to cross uh, the right external iliac artery. By uh, trying again and again and again, we've ended up with this image. I, I would actually I like to ask at this stage, are you, does anyone want to comment about this image from my co-panelists? So at this point, we were getting blood coming back from the right side catheter and we were looking at this beautiful image of the aorta and the right side iliac system. So are you luminal there? That's what I'm asking, am I? Well, you'd have to do a run there to confirm. This is the run. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm, very, I'm very provocative as a person. So yeah, this... I've seen those pictures before and, and you can, you're in some sort of dissection flat, but there's obviously a communication with the true lumen but it's not true lumen. So this is completely subminimal. This is absolutely subminimal. And I can prove that by doing the run from the other side. Look at this run. The run from the left side actually demonstrates that we can see 
both the right and the left alias system. On the first picture, I cannot see the left side alias system, which means that the contrast stays in the subintimal space. So definitely subintimal. And this is the thing that people can get wrong and start standing at this level and then get a disaster, as you can imagine, while they completely compromise the left side. So we thought that something is wrong and we tried to re-enter, but unfortunately there was no option to manage to go to the true luminal without, to the true lumen without using some kind of re-entry device. And what we decided at that point is use the access from the left side, do an angiogram, and then following that, use the re-entry device in order to manage to go back to the true lumen. And that was successful, as you can see, uh, again, using the Outback. I think it's quite a robust device to use in this kind of cases. Managed to get access from both sides and decided, sorry, to start treating the right side. So we ballooned initially with a six millimeter balloon and this was the image we got. So just with a six millimeter balloon, you see a massive extravasation. So I don't think we were aggressive. I don't know if you have any uh, different opinion about that, but six millimeter balloon is quite sensible size to do in order to predilate and uh, eventually stand your, um, the, the, the occlusion. But even with a six millimeter balloon, we had a massive extravasation and the basin actually completely decompromised and uh, went to a, a shock. So the, the immediately um, management of that was to place a balloon to occlude, eventually upsize the uh, seats and place a cover stand. Okay. Then we thought, let's treat the other side again. As you can see, six millimeter balloon. We were worried that we will have a second rupture, but actually we were lucky at this level, at this site, and we didn't have any problems to begin with. But what happened was that, so we, we had no problem with the predilatation. We placed a seven millimeter stand. And as I suppose most of you do, we post dilated with a seven millimeter balloon in order to achieve an one one uh, uh, post dilatation of the uh, recently inserted stand. And this is what happened. Again, massive extravasation. The immediate response again was to place a balloon to, to control the bleeding until we get the cover stand. We placed the cover stand and this was the uh, final result. Any questions? Any comments? Yeah, there's quite a few. We won't be surprised to know. Um, I mean, that's very helpful to uh, to show such a complex case. And one of the obvious questions is, what should you do in the, in the event of a rupture? So just uh, just go through that again for the delegates. So yes, of course. So that, that, that this is the main reason why I've presented this. So the first thing we did, especially in the Alex, I, what I'm also telling all my fellows is, once you do a balloon dilatation in the Alex system. Do not remove the balloon from the seat. Don't take the balloon out. Do an angiogram. See if you have any problems. And if you have no problems, then you can take the balloon out. If you see any signs or suspicious of extravasation, the first thing to do immediately is to reinflate the balloon in order to control the bleeding. That gives you time. It, it, it buys you time to open the stand or think what is the next option, which in these cases, the next option, the next uh, immediately step is to use a cover stand in order to protect and in order to heal, to, to treat that extravasation. Does that make sense? I don't know if I have answered the question. Yeah, I'm feeling quite stressed just watching it. Um, there was a question from the, uh, from the group. If you re-enter too high up in the aorta, how high mm -hmm. up are you prepared to extend your stents? Can I show you the next case? Do I have five minutes? No, you do not, I'm afraid. <laughs> so I don't see a problem. Uh, you can stand, you can convert that to a syrup basically. So you can place a stand even in the aorta and then build it down. You can put stands up to whichever level you re-enter. However, my recommendation is always use the re-entry device in order to manage to re-enter in a controlled way as close to the bifurcation as possible. Yeah, I think a lot of people haven't necessarily had experience with the re-entry device. Um, what do you think about covering too many lumbers? 
Again, I don't see an issue with that, especially if we use non-covered stents, there is always flowing through the struts and it's not going to cause any massive problems. And we're talking about patients who already have significant atheromatic disease and the vessels are already um, not great in terms of, prote in order, in terms of giving uh, the flow to the lumbars. There is no risk whatsoever as part as we have been standing this kind of uh, lesions for four, so long and we haven't had any issues with that. Okay, and one last question. Mm -hmm. um, does the degree of calcification of the vessels affect your choice of what you would do? On what sense? About how you cross or what is your final treatment? I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, so yeah. what you would use and then would you cover, would you primarily stent or covered stent? Uh, I will always stand the Alex system. I will never do a pyelon angioplasty and I will try to initiate to pri primary stand, not direct stand. And that is predilated usually with a very, very small balloon and in just to allow enough space for the assist to travel through the occlusion. And once the cyst travels through the occlusion, I follow the same approach as Kazi, where you place the cyst, then, then you, are, you unveil, you uncover the stent inside the occlusion and you balloon the stent, you inflate the stent directly to uh, open the vessel. That's wonderful. I really appreciate you making the effort. I, you should have seen him guys running down the street to catch his train. So thank, thank you very you. much. Very uh, we'll much. move on to the next speaker, which is Klaus Overbeck, uh, who's based in Sunderland and is going to talk to you about a couple of cases. Yes, uh, good evening. Um, these are my, uh, my disclosures. Um, if one wants to condense the evidence uh, for good patency with ILEC CTOs, you would have to think Peter Gaines, primary stenting has lower embolization risk and better patency. Covered stents have better patency co-risk and the trial, the data from Munich suggests that large stents have better patency um, and task grading may not be that relevant. So that kind of sounds familiar, large covered stents, stent grafts, and it is because that's what we use for open surgery. So we use large stents, prosthetic, treat outflow disease, and this gives good long-term uh, uh, patency. Um, the problem with doing that endovascular is there might be not that much space in an artery like this one. You can see there is bulky disease, the stent graft is inflated, and one has to appreciate that in some patients, the stent graft might not lie, be lying inside of the artery. So I would like to invite you to think more like with an EVA. So the landing zones for the stents, proximally distance, are actually... Uh, ceiling zones, so proximally the infraring aorta, the aortic bifurcation, distally the common femoral artery or the epigastric arch, uh, the external iliac ar artery. Um, so this would be kind of my recipe for these. I do these cases in the hybrid theater with fusion under general anesthesia. I use always ultrasound guided access. I use dedicated CTO wires and an outback catheter to re-enter if necessary, and I use covered stent crafts, mainly Vyabans and Atriums. So starting with the ultrasound guided access, this is a, a, a you can see the needle entering the artery, a puncture very low, uh, which is a, a safe puncture, but also to have enough space in the common from artery for the sheath. And you can see now I can follow the wire right up to the occlusion and I deliberately stop there because I do not want to cross the occlusion with that kind of wire. For that, I use a CTO wire. This is a one I uh, borrowed from the cardiologist. It's an 014 wire, which has very good ability to puncture the cup, but then is flexible enough, enough to, to truck around the corners. And because it's 014, you can try repeatedly into the occlusion um, without burning any bridges because it creates such little holes that you might just be able to find that micro channel to get up. Um, now, this is the first patient, 63-year-old woman with short distance claudication, ex-smoker. These images just basically show you the, uh, the calcifications, but if you do a axial reconstruction, you can see the actual problem. So she has this full length occlusion on the left side, the external common ILEC is eight, the external five millimeters. Um, but she also has this rather small common uh, femoral artery. 
on the same side, three, just under four millimeters, but very distally, you can see the arch is seven millimeters. So if you were to just start like this, this is the first image after the puncture, you wouldn't really know where to go. Um, traditionally at that point, um, the approach is to puncture the other side to create proximal images that you know where your target is. But this is where fusion comes in. Um, and fusion basically in a nutshell is a 3D reconstruction of a CT scan matched on table with the plain X-ray and you have then a mobile a mask that you can follow. And this is with the system we use, uh, the GE. Um, I create on the workstation a center line. I then kind of decorate that with little rings. So I know exactly where my wire has to go and then um, create first a, a mask with uh, the bone and then use a DSA to overlay that uh, mask. And very helpful there is to use the branches of the external iliac archie, the epigastric and the deep circumflex to get the rotation right. So once you have done that, and this is the back to our case, you see these, um, these images, you can see that little rings and the Asahi wire is now tracking up these rings and you can see the re-entry here, not re-entry, just enter, entry into the altar luminally in this patient. So I then place this uh, wirebound stem graft very low down into the distal common femoral archi to the level where I know that the vessel is, um, is healthy. And then um, at the top, supplement this with an atrium because the total length was about 18 millimeters, 18 centimeters. So the atrium at the top, and then I seal this with a balloon dilatation at the bottom first. So I don't express any embolic material and then often start at the top as well. And then the rest of the stent, you can see the dilated uh, stent craft on the left. So when you complete this, I tend to, touch it up a little bit with an even larger balloon, um, which is not really an angioplasty, just to get that right. And if you look now at the distal end, you have basically uh, converted this three and a half millimeter common femoral archery into a nice eight millimeter uh, archery. And you have a scenario that looks very much like a, a, a autofemoral uh, graft. This is the second case, a um, 45 year old woman with uh, rest pain and short distance claudication, ex smoker. And here the axial recons you can see not very calcified, uh, full length occlusion. And you can see there might be a problem in the bifurcation looking at the configuration. It looks a bit narrow and she has disease in the common uh, iliac archie. She has no real symptoms on that side. Um, if you then uh, look at the first puncture image. Again, you couldn't do this just with an ipsilateral puncture alone unless you have fusion, which looks like that. So you can see now these um, little rings here that lead me right up to my re-entry point where the bifurcation lies. And I can use this for my navigation. And you can see the confianza wire has approached to kind of close to the common iliac, and at that point, you, I could see the wire was going subintimal, it was diverting from the straight line. There was a slightly kind of spirally pattern to it and re-entered this um, occlusion several times with the same result. So I gave up on the luminal approach and then uh, pushed a teruma wire close to the bifurcation. So at this point, I that's the image on the left, I always have an, a go and see whether with a bit of manipulation, I can get into the order. This is a previous case to show you what I mean. You can see the wire being subintimal, but you wiggle about and sometimes you find a soft spot and re-enter into the order, which did not work in this case. So I advanced the loop a bit into the order. So I was then able to use the output cassette. You're familiar with it. It's very precise, particularly with fusion. And um, I have, pretty much stopped you using integrate approaches because of it. You can use it in the common eye, like in the order, you can use it in a patent vessel, which is the original approach. But if you want to enter into a, a longer aortic occlusion, you can enter into the occluded aorta as well 
together with the CTO wire. So if you don't want to re-enter close to the uh, renal arches. Now, this is how this kind of thing looks. With fusion, you can see that you can see that you have that artery right in front of you. You go AP, you go lateral. You don't have to do several roadmap runs because the diffusion is fixed. And you can then very, very precisely enter the aorta where you want to be, which is important in this kind of case. One important step when you do use the outback is you have entered with an 014 wire. So you cannot push a catheter or anything up there because you will push the intima off the aortic wall potentially and create a pretty disastrous dissection. So the trick here is to predilate with a very small uh, 014, 018 balloon and then have the space to, to move a sheath up. And you can see on the right side, this was the actual first time we did any use any contrast for this recanalization, apart from the two images at the beginning to create the match. And if you now look at this in more detail, you get the impression this is not going to go well, trying to stay below the bifurcation here. Um, and she has disease on the left side. So I decided to again use a Vibon stent graft uh, closed at the top, and then two HM stent grafts, eight millimeter in a kissing position. And this is the final result. You can see if you mark that up, the bifurcation is well matched. The order is on the small side, but my approach to kissing stents is that I try to reach that kind of sandwich configuration of a double D to fill that bifurcation, um, which is very similar to what the Sarah procedure uh, is and this is something you have to really plan with CT sizing and get that right. The, if you keep in mind, you have a aortic diameter, two balloons side by side would stretch the archie into a elliptic shape. And I sometimes just use that formula for ellipsis to calculate exactly what size stents I could uh, deploy there. And then on the left-hand side, you can see the External eyelid is small on the small side. I post touched that up, post dilated it with a seven millimeter balloon so that I have a, a long term patency because kissing stents, um, I don't like the idea of one of them going down. And so, in, in this patient, I thought I had a quite nice result. So, these are two short cases just to give you an idea how I would approach that. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus, for keeping the time. That's uh, two very interesting cases. Uh, so interesting, in fact, that no one was able to ask any questions at all. Right. Even though they should be asking you, wow, that's amazing technical stuff. How did you get pictures like that? They're asking about your antiplatelet regime. Um, I've got a question. Yeah. Are these patients being treated in theater under general anesthetic or are they under regional or in x-ray? I always do them in theater under general anesthesia because if you want to really have the stents fully deployed, you have to have the patient pain-free. For fusion, you also want the patient to be still so that you do not lose that much. And the, the third thing is that um, what I would like to point out is, is you need to do this kind of cases in very close uh, cooperation with the anesthetist arterial line. Every time I do a step that could lead to a rupture, I say to the anesthetist, we're taking a balloon down, we're putting a stent in so that you do pick up that moment where there might be a problem in immediately and deal with that because the patient is not able to tell you that they're having pain. Because if a patient is awake, the, the, the hallmark of a rupture is that the pain gets worse when you take the balloon down, not better. Yeah, yeah we've seen that. Um, a question about the um, collaterals and the IMA in particular. I think yeah. that's more about um, covering, but I, I think it's a valid question. Do you worry about bowel ischemia? Yes, and that's why I tend to not primarily used syrups. Uh, I don't like to sacrifice the IMA. Saying that I, I never really had a problem primarily with these kind of cases, but I worry about it. And um, I think if one postulates the, the kissing stents enough, you get a result which looks very similar. On the other hand, you can use a very short stent, like a short Bentley or something to create a syrup below the IMA. But the problem I always think is that to deploy that in such a way that you don't end up with the shoulder of the balloon in the iliac artery 
and then potentially create a rupture. Or if you don't do that, you have the, the, the stent sitting there and you might lose control of it because you push the balloon up to get out of that. So I, I'm very uh, open to, to a discussion how to best deal with that. That's a, that's a real problem area. There's a, there's a plea from somebody, how do, how do I get fusion in my unit? Or what advice would you give somebody who doesn't have fusion or how would they get it? They're, they're basically different systems. So you have the discovery from GE is, is a dedicated fusion system. And that's why I, I like it. And it is, uh, I do complex fenestrate, all that with fusion and it makes life a lot easier. Um, the um, alternative is you can have an online system which is what Tom Corral with his company has developed where you can buy into online fusion that works pretty much with any system, but you that is not entirely cheap. So it's a budget er issue there. All the big companies offer fusion, but the practical side of it is difficult to assess. So they, some of them say, of course we can do fusion, but you probably need an engineer to do it. And so you need to, have a system that's day-to-day -day practical, but I think fusion for all vascular imaging is going to be one of the uh, the features that that one should consider. Thanks. Mm. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, moving on to our last speaker now is Dave Basanque from South Wales, who's going to uh, experience lockdown just like we are up here. Uh, Dave, over to you. Okay, I I'm going to rattle through this and um, and. I'm hopefully not going to overlap too much with what's been said already. So I'll try and skip through things where we, we sort of had a, a small bit of overlap. Uh, I did create some images in PowerPoint. I do say that. Um, I also uh, compared Klaus to your imaging. The uh, imaging that I've got looked like is got uh, made from CRM in about the 1980s. And that's probably because that's when it was bought. bought. <laughs> Um, but I really enjoy iliac disease because I think when you're faced with an iliac case, you've got so many options. You've got axillo by fem, aorto by fem, fem fem crossovers. You might have to do an inflow stenting of your fem fem crossovers. Then you've got iliofemoral crossovers, either ipsilateral or contralateral. And then you've got what I'm going to be talking a bit more about, which is common femoral endotrectomy and iliac stenting. And then there's other things which are a, a little bit more bizarre. And if we've got time, we'll get to a remote atherectomy case. So I'm going to be really talking about the um, combined surgical and endovascular treatment, which Kaji's already mentioned and some of the other speakers have already mentioned about as well. So I'll try and skip over the things which we've been discussed. Uh, we've already discussed. I'm not going to talk about the actual ballooning and stenting. As far as I'm concerned, once a wire's passed, the management of that lesion will be as has already been discussed. So it's more to do with the, the thought process, the steps and the surgical management of these kind of patients. So if we just have a think basically about the patterns of CIA disease, if, if you were to isolate, a, put a stent isolated in a CIA lesion like this with your common femoral artery still occluded, well, it, it, just, it just wouldn't run, would it? You, you're running into an internal iliac, so it might run, run for a short period of time, but what are you treating? It, it, you just would never treat that in isolation. And similarly, you wouldn't ever do an endotrectomy with an iliac lesion above it. And if you've got EIA disease, then it becomes even more obvious that you would just never either stent or operate in isolation. But maybe this is a bit more of what we're faced with. We're, we're faced with disease in different levels. And you can take an approach to say, right, let's treat the most significant disease first. So if the common femoral is the most diseased, let's do an endotrectomy first. And then if the common iliac is the next most stenotic disease, uh, section and the patient still has symptoms, let's treat that. And then EIA if, if you still need further treatment. But I think you've got to be careful not to um, be backed into corners when you're doing this. So this was one of the cases that was handed to me after about being a consultant for five minutes. This, this patient had an EIA stent uh, with a lovely result. Everything was fine from that point of view, but they noted that in the runoff, the common femoral was not looking too happy. And, and this, this was done in a chap who was probably about 65. He, he was fitting well. So it, you, I couldn't leave it there because it would eventually, uh, the stent eventually would go down and he'd be in trouble. And the disease, although it looks like there's a significant gap, it did actually, the calc went all the way up to this stent here. So um, you, the, the issue with this is you can't clamp proximally easy. You, 
you obviously can't clamp the stem, uh, the stent, because you will crush it. Uh, so then what I ended up doing was an endarterectomy and then balloon control, which was passed into the stent. And then I had to do a rapid endarterectomy because you've got a balloon, which means that you've got static blood in a stent uh, with a risk of it clotting off. So this is an example of when if you stent too early and don't do the endarterectomy, you can be backed into a little bit of a corner. But you also don't want to stent um, too late either. Uh, Imagine we'd done this the other way around. If you did the endarterectomy first and then you came back to do the stent, well, then you'd have to go in through a redo groin. Um, and, and that's not to say it's not possible. It's perfectly possible to puncture a scarred groin and to perform a procedure then. But you also have to bring them back as well. In the year of COVID, we probably should be doing um, uh, one operation and get everything sorted all at once. So in my basic way of considering the operation, you expose a common femoral artery, you do your heparin, your clamps, your arteriotomy, your endarterectomy and closure, and then you stent the eyelid lesion and do your completion angiogram. And key, key to this is passing the wire, I think. And when I say passing the wire, let's imagine a CAA stenosis. What I mean by passing the wire is actually safely navigating the wire into the EIA. And I think you've got two options here. One of which uh, is to, um, puncture the artery uh, which is exposed okay so you, you do the wire first and then you do everything around the wire and then you put the patch in at the end and the alternative which is casio what you were mentioning is that you puncture the patch so you do you complete your patch you close it and then you puncture the patch uh, you, you sort of patch then wire first now there is an alternative which is when you uh, pass a wire from the contralateral groin or from the arm but this can get a bit confusing because it all depends if it's a bailout maneuver or if it's a primary maneuver and i think in, in the 10 minutes i've got i haven't got much time to talk about that but the issue with the patch and wire or certainly when i've had it is that you're always going to be passing a wire up and you're going to be hitting that dissection plane now this is an image obviously of an internal carotid and the dissection plane has been neatly tacked down. But in a common femoral, your disease, which is always posterior, you've gone in with a clip, you've grabbed hold of it, you've yanked it out. It's, a, it's quite far away from you. You can't necessarily see it and it's raggedy. So the issue with, um, that I found with putting the patch on and then puncturing the patch and then threading the wire up is finding the true, uh, the true plane and avoiding being subintimal. And so this is one, uh, one technique, which is the pre-arteriotomy guide wire access. And what you do is you expose the artery, but before you put any clamps on, you puncture it. And what to, in order to puncture the artery, you need a pulse and you need a bit of artery, which is disease-free enough to puncture. So realistically, it's never in the middle of the common femoral. It's always up here by the inguinal ligament because the rest of it is solid full of chalk. And then what you do is you uh, I, I use a micropuncture kit, put the needle in and you thread the wire in uh, and you just pass it up until you hit uh, a bit of resistance and then you stop. You extend your arteriotomy to the wire. So your wire then comes out through it and then you complete your patch and do your stenting through that. And here we can see that you, uh, you can put a needle through the patch to bring the wire out. My, my preference is actually to put the wire out to the side of the patch. It always sits laterally and it just stays there. And you don't tie the patch down. Uh, you simply put a rubber shod here with two ends. You snug your catheter up and you proceed from there. Um, so this was one case. Um, and again, very budget images, I'm afraid. But this chap had an ejection fraction about 10%, but he had a critical limb ischemia. And his right leg is the issue. And you can see you've got some... Uh, stenotic disease of his common iliac, but his external iliac, these are actually pinhole stenoses. And his CT shows that his common, here his common femoral doesn't look too bad, but actually his CT shows that his common femoral almost occludes in a couple of places. So he definitely needed a hybrid approach. And the problem with him is that the left-hand side is out. So if I'm struggling here to get a wire cross, I can't go on the left-hand side as a bailout maneuver. Or if I do, I'm gonna to have to operate on there and this chap with a very bad heart is going to be on the table for even longer. So I'm glad to say what I managed to do is puncture somewhere high up here, pass a wire, micropuncture wire. And actually, I got it through these lesions. And that was just passing it up, uh, not, with, uh, not with any fluoroscopic guidance. And then complete the endarterectomy around that. 
Um, and these are my very budget views showing that I'm very glad that here I'm luminal. OK, so I've passed my uh, initial sheath up. And then after that, it's relatively simple. It's Terumo, catheter, stiff wire and stent. And here we see the completion angiogram uh, and, and good flow into the profunda. Um, I'm also going to talk about remote atherectomy, uh, which we don't do that much of in South Wales, to be honest. Uh, we do occasionally. So if you're doing a common femoral anatrectomy, you can also pass your uh, atherectomy device up alongside in, in, within the inside of the artery. And you end up pulling out a core of material uh, as well as the common femoral arterial disease as well. And if you've got fancy kit, you've got the ones that, um, that actually cut the plaque and then you can pull it out. There's one with a gear stick uh, that you move to various positions to get your uh, eyelets to open like this. Um, this is what I generally tend to use. It comes in multiple sizes and generally you think that it's gonna to be too small and, and then it works okay. So this chap, um, uh, he needed revascularization. He's got quite significant stenotic disease in his CIA, but his main disease is he's got complete occlusion of his external iliac and his common femoral. Um, unlike the other guy, he's, he's had his common femoral cleaned out on the left-hand side, so there's an option of up and over. Uh, but for this chap, what I did is I, it, exposed his common femoral artery, but I also exposed uh, to the Rutherford Morris to get his CIA, IIA and EIA out. Uh, did the uh, endotrectomy in the common femoral artery, but then using this for my ring, then slid the ring all the way up the EIA to this point here. And then with a bit of finger fracture and um, clamp fracture, fracture the plaque, and then out comes this uh, stick of chalk along with the common femoral artery disease. And at that point, um, I hadn't got any wires up, but as that came out, it went from a case where you needed no proximal clamps on at all to pulsatile flow to the groin. So at that point, I was happy to then put a patch on, put a needle into the patch, and manage to pass a wire up uh, relatively easily, actually, across this bit uh, relatively easy. And, and as you can see, we've got a stent from the common iliac all the way down to external iliac here. And I think you'd agree, this, this, there's no balloon. This is just naturally opened up as it is. So you've completely debolt this area of artery, uh, this artery, which otherwise would have been heavily calcified. And we've got satisfactory runoff into the SFA and Profunda. And that's it. Thank you very much. Well done, Dave. Perfect timing as well. Um, there was a question about uh, when would you consider doing just open surgery? Uh, well, I think we, would, Go on. we consider that for everybody, but um, but I think it's if you've got if you've got an option of doing an endarterectomy and inflow stenting, I have to be honest, I think it works pretty well, especially if you can debulk the external iliac. I think that a common iliac occlusion responds pretty well to, to stenting. But if you've got a heavily calcified external iliac uh, artery, for example, if you took that last case, if you just dug out as common femoral and then you stented all the way along that, I think the patency for that would not necessarily be as good as, as that, that surgical approach. Yeah, I think we've, we've, well, not we, I haven't done anything. I've just sat here um, listening to you guys. It's very entertaining. You've covered pretty much everything I could think of. Uh, I'm not going to finish yet, but I do genuinely want to say thank you so much for putting the effort in. I think we've seen a very wide range of things uh, going on. Um, I would ask, what, um, what do you think about uh, post-operative medical regimes? Because that, that's a question that's come up from a few people. Uh, some people are talking about the COMPASS trial, uh, the aspirin river oxaband thing. People are asking about antiplatelets, mono, dual. Any, any strict regimes? Uh, well, this is being actually looked at by um, a team in Bristol who are trying to work up an RCT to look at this. Should we be giving these patients dual or mono, monotherapy? And there's a, a sum total of one RCT which looks at dual versus monotherapy with very small numbers. And I think it overcalls its outcomes in terms of beneficial effects in the dual group. We probably need larger numbers to, to prove that. Um, I, I, I'm happy with monotherapy and iliac disease. Anyone else? Um, can you hear me, Lise? 
Yeah, you're very quiet, class. I saw you nip out for some food as well. That was uh, I was quite jealous. <laughs> I I think my approach to antiplatelet therapy depends on vessel size. So starting with the ileg, I would put them on clopidogel probably initially, a few weeks of aspirin and then monotherapy. The smaller the vessel, you know, tibial arches, I would give you antiplatelet therapy for life or the compass combination. Um, that's my approach. So we're certainly talking more about using rivaroxaban in addition to aspirin. It's not widely adopted in the community yet, though, so we're struggling to start it in hospitals. Um, there's an interesting question here. Uh, is there a risk of rupture with the Volmar ring? Yes, there is. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you see the ring under the artery. So you see this, this sort of metal object sliding up uh, along the artery. Now you can actually do this entire thing without exposing the arteries um, because you could do it under fluoroscopic guidance uh, and then use the, the device which will open, fracture the artery and then slide it back. Um, and that actually does have the advantage of that you don't remove all of the uh, sort of adventitial tissue around it. And so what I would suggest is make sure that you can make sure you can clamp the common iliac artery. That's the first thing. And the second thing is there's no need to skeletalize the EIA right from the inguinal ligament all the way up to the bifurcation. You can just, uh, you can just get the bifurcation out and leave this relatively untouched. And as long as you can see that you're, you're going in, in, the, in the right direction, you can just pass it up. So we're running out of time. I don't know if it's a usual Zoom thing where they just cut you off. Um... So th before we do, thank you everyone for making the effort. Thanks to the delegates for the questions. Um, I would say, uh, I put it in one of the chats, but I didn't uh, say it out loud, is the MDT is really, really important. Have an anaesthetist in your MDT. You need people who've experienced the, the old style open surgery as well to know what's possible. So have a, have a good group around you and, and discuss these cases at MDT. Um, thank you to the VS and BSET for uh, organizing this. Um, Andy Garman's asked me to mention that there is a, a two-year fellowship available jointly with the Vascular Society and the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. It's not the usual test tube stuff, he tells me. It's a human factors course, a human factors um, research. So have a look on the website for that. Uh, I think we've got two seconds left. So if we get cut off, thank you. We haven't, okay. <laughs> I can relax now. So yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Um, I don't really have anything else to add. Any of the any of the panel want to say anything before we, we sign off? Silence. Just okay. Well, <laughs> thank you so much, particularly Thanasis, for uh, making a physical effort to get here. I really appreciate it. Um, so thank you very much, and uh, have a good evening. <laughs>